Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Judge Gorsuch, welcome to you and your family. I've often read stories about earlier Supreme Court nominees and how little politics played uh, any role in the selection and vetting of the nominees. Those of us on the Democratic side, as you can hear, are frequently warned not to let politics to be part of this decision. When I consider the path to this historic hearing, this plea rings hollow. The journey began with the untimely death of Justice Scalia in February of 2016. President Obama met his constitutionally required obligation by nominating Judge Merrick Garland to fill that vacancy in March of 2016. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell announced that for the first time in the history of the United States Senate, he would refuse Judge Garland a hearing and a vote. He went further and said he would refuse to even meet with the judge. It was clear that Senator McConnell was making a political decision hoping a Republican president would be elected. He was willing to ignore the tradition and precedent of the Senate so that you could sit at this witness table today. In May of Sep and September of 2016, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump released a list of 21 names, including yours, that he would consider to fill the Scalia vacancy. President Trump thanked the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation, two well-known Republican advocacy groups, for providing the list that included your name. Your nomination is part of a Republican strategy to capture our judicial branch of government. That is why the Senate Republicans kept this Supreme Court va seat vacant for more than a year and why they left 30 judicial nominees who had received bipartisan approval of this committee to die on the Senate calendar as President Obama left office. Despite all of this, you're entitled to be judged on the merits. The Democrats of the Senate Judiciary Committee will extend to you a courtesy which Senate Republicans denied to Judge Garland, a respectful hearing and a vote. Judge Gorsuch, you've been nominated to a lifetime appointment on the highest court in the land, and this court has the final say on matters of fundamental importance affecting all Americans. You have a lengthy record before the Tenth Circuit, and we'll ask many questions. We have found in the past that nominees try their best to dodge most of the questions, but it's our job to try to still seek the truth. At the nomination hearing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, my friend and predecessor, Senator Paul Simon, set forth a standard for Supreme Court nominees. I've noted this with each Supreme Court nominee that I've questioned. He said, quote, you face a much harsher judge than this committee, and that's the judgment of history. And that judgment is likely to revolve around the question, did you restrict freedom or did you expand it? Let me be clear, when I talk about expanding freedom, I'm not talking about freedom for corporations. We the people does not include corporations. Senator Simon could never have imagined that the Supreme Court would give corporations rights and freedoms that were previously reserved only for individuals under the Constitution, and yet that's where we find ourselves with the Roberts Court. It's often said the Roberts Court is a corporate court because of its pro-business tilt. A study by the Constitutional Accountability Center found that the court ruled for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce 69% of the time. The court has certainly favored big business on issues like forced arbitration, corporate price fixing, workplace discrimination cases, just to name a few. But the Roberts Court has gone further than just ruling the way corporate America wants. In the 2010 Citizens United case, the Supreme Court held for the first time that corporations have the same rights as living, breathing people to spend money on elections. And that was followed in 2014 by the Hobby Lobby decision, which allowed for-profit corporations to discriminate against employees based on the corporation's assertion of religious belief. I don't recall ever seeing a corporation in the pews of old St. Patrick's Church in Chicago. Our founders never believed that corporations were endowed with certain inalienable rights, but we're seeing the Supreme Court expand the rights of this legal fiction, a corporation, at the expense of the voices and choices of the American people. This strikes at the heart of the Supreme Court's promise to provide equal justice under the law. Judge Gorsuch, you took part in that Hobby Lobby case when it was before the Tenth Circuit. 
As I read the case, I was struck by the extraordinary, even painful links the court went to to protect the religious beliefs of the corporation and its wealthy owners and how little attention was paid to the employees, to their constitutionally protected religious beliefs, their choices as individuals, and the burdens that the court's decision placed on them. I want to hear from you about a pattern I've seen in your decisions on the Tenth Circuit. In case after case, you've either dismissed or rejected efforts by workers and families to recognize, the rights, to recognize their rights or defend their freedoms. Cases like Trans Am Trucking, which we've already spoken to, Alphonse Madden, I had a chance to sit down with him just last week. He was the truck driver from Detroit who was driving around Chicago in the middle of January when a malfunction in his trailer froze the brakes and he was forced to pull over on the side of the road. Al sat there on his cell phone with the dispatcher for the truck company who told him, don't leave this truck no matter what, and if you do, pull the trailer with you. Well, that was a big problem because the brakes were frozen and it would have been a safety hazard. And so he waited and waited and the hours passed and he started feeling numb and sick. You see, there was no heater in the truck and according to his recollection, it was so cold, it was 14 degrees below. Not as cold as your dissent, Judge Gorsuch, which argued that his firing was lawful. You cited a strict textualistic argument to make your point, but you chose the text that you focused on. Thank goodness the majority in this case pointed out that common sense in the Oxford Dictionary supported the majority view. Compass Environmental Incorporated, another one of your cases, your dissent would have vacated a penalty against an employer who failed to train construction employee Christopher Carter to avoid the elect electrocution hazard that killed him. Strickland versus UPS, your dissent would have kept Carol Strickland's sex dis discrimination case from going to a jury, even though your fellow judges said she provided ample evidence that she was regularly outperforming her male colleagues and treated less favorably. I want to hear more about your views on fundamental individual rights that the Supreme Court is tasked to defend, the right to privacy, the right for all faiths to practice their religion, the right to vote, equal production, protection, and the rights of women. The committee has received two letters from students who you taught last year that raised some serious concerns. Tomorrow we'll get to the bottom of it, I hope. We've learned you were an aggressive defender of exec executive power during the time of the Bush administration. In June 2004, after the Abu Ghraib torture scandal, I authored the first bill to ban the cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment of detainees. That legislation became the McCain Torture Amendment, which passed the Senate in December of 2005 by an overwhelming 90 to 9 vote. But when President Bush signed the amendment into law, he issued a signing statement claiming he had the authority to ignore the McCain Amendment. Turns out you were deeply involved in this unprecedented signing statement. We need to know what you'll do when you're called upon to stand up to this president or any president if he claims the power to ignore laws that protect fundamental human rights. You're going to have your hands full with this president. He's going to keep you busy. It's incumbent on any nominee to demonstrate that he or she will serve as an independent check or balance on the presidency. There are some warning flags. February 23rd, White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus said, and I quote, Neil Gorsuch represents the type of judge that has the vision of Donald Trump, close quote. I want to hear from you why Mr. Priebus would say that. Make no mistake, when it comes to the treatment of workers, women, victims of discrimination, people of minority religious faith, and our Constitution, most Americans question whether we need a Supreme Court justice with the vision of Donald Trump. With my constitutional responsibility firmly in mind, I look forward to questioning tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.